Well, hello, and welcome to today's episode of the Power of Your Mind podcast. You're listening to episode number 152. I'm Victoria Gallagher, Law of Attraction hypnotist and number one best-selling author of Practical Law of Attraction, Align Yourself with the Manifesting Conditions and Successfully Attract Your Desires. I'm also the founder of HipTalk.com and HypnoCloud apps, which gives you access to over 500 hypnosis recordings right in the palm of your hand. So be sure to download that app from the app stores. And today I have a very special guest with me, Heather Zumaraga. Heather Zumaraga is a business consultant and a leader in the financial services industry who has distinguished herself as a highly regarded and well-connected source. She is also the author of the business bestseller, HarperCollins leadership book, The Man's Guide to Corporate Culture, released in 2021. And she is also the president of Zuma Global. And she can be found on mansguidetocorporateculture.com heatherzumaraga.com and Twitter, Heather Zuma and Instagram, Heather Zumaraga. And she has just recently written this book, The Man's Guide to uh, Corporate Culture. And she has had 2 billion in sales for asset managers, Washington Life Magazine, recognized in 2015 as one of the most powerful people under 40. And so today, Heather is going to be sharing some of her insights on succeeding in your career post-pandemic. So welcome to the show, Heather. Hi, Victoria. Good to be here. Thanks for the big intro. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's so so great to meet you. You have uh, definitely impressed me with your bio and all of the wonderful accomplishments and accolades and uh, and your beautiful background and so for those of you who are just listening you've got to go on to my youtube channel and watch this interview um because i'm just looking at this beautiful woman this very well accomplished person and so so really really thank you oh thank you (laughs) thank you so uh let's just get uh right down into your book and like what your book is about and you know why why you wrote this book right well i work with thousands of financial advisors across the country it's a predominantly male industry and all the although the book is is called the man's guide to corporate culture it's actually for women as well it's for everyone uh, kind of as we go back to work post-pandemic and address some of the challenges that we face relating uh, to each other and our coworkers. I mean, for example, we're on Zoom right now, you know, and, and we're talking to each other on video, but it may be different when we go back to work face-to-face or in person because, well, for the most part, at least I have been um, the majority of us working from home. So you're like a hermit. And it's very different speaking to someone online versus in person. So this book is going to help you uh, as we go back to work, address some of those challenges that we haven't had to deal with over the past year from home. Yeah, it's a, it's very timely, very timely. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. You say uh, you mentioned being in the financial services industry. That was the industry I was in before I left to become a uh, hypnotherapist. Um, and oh, so I know <laughs> it, it, it really is. I mean, in 1993, I believe is when I uh, went for training in Hartford, Connecticut after, um, you know, getting hired in a very, I agree with you, very male dominated. I mean, there were 107 people in my training, 100 men and seven women. <laughs> wow. Wow. Back then, you know, I back had, then. And I had no in my, idea you were in the same type of industry. So then you would enjoy the book as well. I think you would, it'd be perfect for things you may have dealt with at that time. Um, you definitely know where I'm coming from. I do. And, you know, I honestly, um, you know, I was very fortunate to grow up in a household, a female only household. And um, when I say that, you know, I didn't, um, 
I was never taught the differences between men and women or anything like that. I like went into the world blindly without all of the ideas that a lot of people, uh, you know, have about, you know, that it's man's world and we're just working in it. So I really bulldozed my way into anything that I wanted to do. And so it, it's really interesting to hear a different perspective on, you know, the challenges that other people have had. Now I did, I did one time, um, uh, before I actually got started in this career, I did have a situation once where um, I went for an interview and the man uh, said, you know, like, looked at me, looked at my age, looked at the fact that I wasn't married yet and said, you're, or that I was married. I was married to a different man at the time and, and said, you know, you, you, you look like you're getting ready to have kids. Oh. And we're not. Uh, you can't say you know, that anymore in an interview. No, no, no. Oh my! You couldn't even say it back then. I mean, what he said was so inappropriate at that time, telling me basically that he didn't want to hire me because he didn't want to pay for um, somebody to be out on pregnancy. I'm like, no, no, no. I don't even have plan to have kids. But the fact that you even said that, I don't want to work here. Yeah. <laughs> that is not for me. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's right. There are a lot of challenges that women face also, and I think even more so during the pandemic. And, and the book touches upon actually uh, the challenges that, that men also face. But to begin with women, in, during the pandemic, I mean, we saw another 800,000 people lose their jobs last week. 10 million people are unemployed, the majority of which are women. Now, pre-pandemic, more women held jobs than men. It was great. I mean, it was a great time to be a, wom a woman, I think, because the jobs market was booming for everyone across the board. But the pandemic, what happened when the schools are closed is that women are having to quit their jobs. I quit for a few months because I have a five-year-old and I can't work full-time, be a full-time teacher, a full-time parent, take care of all my household responsibilities and duties you know, I, I can't do it all. And, and yes, can the men quit? Sure. But the majority of people leaving the workforce right now during the pandemic have been women. So although I started writing the book before the coronavirus, during the pandemic, as the data shifted, I had to kind of adapt. Well, wait a minute. This was like becoming a woman's world and more women are working than men. But then the pandemic really shifted that dynamic back to what it was before. Interesting. Yeah, I I had no idea that all of that was going on. Like I didn't know the data of the number of, of what I mean, and I guess it kind of stands to reason because the women went home to start uh, caring for their their kids, which couldn't be in school right now. Is that yeah. sort of how that came about? Well, and you think of also the, the, which I know you help people so much with is the mental challenges of not just for the mom or the parent, maybe it's the dad, for the kid, the children in Las Vegas, for example, the suicide rates are off the chart, drug abuse, child abuse, the mental and emotional toll from not just not working, but if you're not used to being a mom full time or taking care of your kids full time, now you've become a full-time teacher and a full-time parent and the kids aren't having a social life. I mean, it's bad enough for toddlers and five-year-olds, but you look at the teenagers and their suicide rates and the drug abuse and it's awful. And that's why I think, you know, services like yours are just so important during this time for so many people that are, that are really struggling. Yeah, it's, it's a hard time for everyone. I mean, it really is. And my heart just goes out to, you know, mothers and, and people that have lost anybody and, you know, and, and anybody who's struggling with this, my heart just really goes out to them. So let's discuss, if, you know, like, what are some of the challenges that, uh, you know, that people are facing uh, today career wise, um, you know, and, and, and how, you know, how do you help people in this book to bridge that transition getting back into the workforce again. Right, well, I, I think it's important as we go back to the workplace, some people may feel anxiety about relating to others if you were introverted before the mm -hmm. pandemic, you're definitely more so now. And some, some people are feeling like, 
oh my gosh, I'm worried in this, in this, call it a new norm, or maybe it's even more politically correct or sensitive environment. And people like yourself may argue, well, thank goodness that you can't ask someone in a job uh, if they're going to get pregnant soon or have babies <laughs> soon because they didn't want to make the commitment of hiring someone who was. But the point is a lot of people are maybe afraid of saying the wrong thing when they're well-intentioned. You know, it's for the good guys. I'm not talking about there's an obvious line between right and wrong, but today that line might be blurred in a very, in a gray area. Um, and so this is for the good guys to figure out what is okay to say? How do I compliment my employees or my, my team members in the workplace, such as women, for example, without them taking offense? Um, and, and what are some of the behaviors, maybe body language that I should and shouldn't do or should and shouldn't say? Yeah, that's a very important point because, you know, it really does seem like, you know, what used to be okay that nobody even thought of anything of it, you know, these days, um, it's just, you know, it's, it's difficult to figure out like, what is the new language that, that we need? To, it's almost like there's a new language. There's a new, there's a new territory that we need to navigate. And, um, you know, some of these, you know, I, it, it's just, it's hard to know how to be socially correct. Uh, the, yeah. the, you know, <laughs> and so, so what are like some of those gotchas that people might need to look out for, you know, where, you know, you, you, yes, you know, two years ago, um, I mean, you know, like recently, uh, you know, this, this is just something that kind of caught me off guard, you know, like, uh, the Chris Harrison on the bachelor, uh, you know, got busted for, you know, saying, well, you know, it used to be okay to dress up for Halloween, like an Indian in an in an Indian costume, yeah. you know. I mean, that was not anymore. Not a, not anymore, you know. And so, um, so it used to be okay to fill in the blank when when it comes to women, and now we, you know, men have to be a little bit uh, different, or, or men and women sensitive so what, and aware, right? Um, in awareness. So, what are some of those things that coming back that people need to be aware of that you know this is like this is this is how we are today like what are some of those exactly and it's not to say that in all aspects of your life you can't be who you are that's very important to be who you are and, and some would argue it's better to be blunt and say the things that you mean but I'm just speaking from the perspective of the workplace to protect your mm -hmm. job, to protect your reputation. Like you pointed out, there are some new rules and guidelines. Um, HR departments are constantly updating their policy handbooks, for example. So I would start there. Every industry is different. The financial industry may be different from the tech world. And I, I think I would start with compliments. We all long for appreciation. And that's number one in terms of surveys that I've conducted when you talk to managers and leaders, what do their employees want from them? They want appreciation. But there's, I don't want to say a right and wrong way, um, but there are some guidelines. And number one was to take the word I out of the compliment. And that, and that kind of helps remove you from getting into any, any trouble as a good guy. For example, I like your work or I like your outfit. Those all sound like okay things to say. But so that the other person doesn't perceive it as that they're doing it for you. Um, you remove the word I, and for example, you could say something like, your work is well done, or your, your outfit looks nice. But to further protect you, don't comment, and I make this point on anyone's appearance or their clothing choices in the workplace. Outside of the workplace, okay. But um, just to keep yourself safe, compliment people on their work accomplishments and remove the word I out of it so people don't feel like you're saying that they're doing it just for you. Right. Well, you know, it seems like what you're saying is actually very common sense. And it seems yeah. <laughs> in, in a way, like, let's just keep the conversations relevant to why we're here. When you're when we're at work, the, we're here to get work done. So if if we're talking to people in the workplace, we want to keep the conversations relevant to the work environment and not on things like 
appearance and and things that are just not even really relevant to being at work does that yeah. sort of make I mean that's my own summer <laughs> summary of well, what you're saying but that's the thing is that a lot of this stuff stepping back sitting back and thinking about it should be obvious and is obvious but then if you're on Twitter or social media which I hope you you meaning the viewer the audience doesn't do a lot of because that's not good for you either but you you then read about a lot of these instances of people not wearing pants in their interviews or guys sending pictures that they shouldn't be sending or doing the, the things that that should be obvious they're not doing them they're doing the opposite so i'm like i guess these things need to be said <laughs> just so you remember <laughs> Like, yeah, that does seem like yeah, just so you just just so we're on the same page. We all like to wear bottoms here. <laughs> yeah, I I have pants on right right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah, no, they may be I, yoga pants, but <laughs> yeah, which hey, which is fine. But when you're on Zoom, there's a whole chapter on like how to dress as you go back to work, which like you're saying shouldn't really matter. But if you're in the professional corporate office setting, it does. It really does. Right. So, I mean, so getting back to like appreciation, you, you mentioned that, you know, people, all people like to be appreciated. I think honestly, it's like one of the most important things is for you to know that whatever it is that you're doing is recognized um, and acknowledged and, and appreciated. So, I mean, how important is that, you know, at, at work? There was a, um, a study done by Pew Research that said that 66% uh, of adults age, six, age 65 and older find it harder to navigate in the workplace. So it's not just millennials that maybe haven't even ever had a corporate job yet. It's those that are older that maybe thought they would have been retired by now, but haven't, and they're still working. And they really want to be appreciated. Um, the, uh, I think the majority of, of, of people do. And WorkHuman, which is a, a performance management platform, found a strong correlation between the frequency of recognition at work and lower stress levels. So this goes back to the mental aspects that you talk about so often that to lower employee stress, appreciation is necessary. And you don't just benefit from hearing it from your boss, you, you benefit for, from giving it from giving it to others also increases your, you know, dopamine levels and endorphins and all the stuff that, that you know more about um, than, than most. And so you benefit not just from receiving compliments, but also giving them. And what are some ways that a person can begin to like show employees and, and other people that, you know, they're appreciated that you care about them? So I spoke with uh, the CEO of a property restoration company. Um, they work in the home building industry, I guess is, is the right thing to say. And, and he said that he writes handwritten notes. And that was one of the um, biggest, I guess, important factors that, that he has realized over his decades of being a CEO of a small business that really impacted people positively. He would write a few handwritten notes, and then this is pre-pandemic, he would see those same notes in people's desk or in their, in their cubbies, like in their cubicles, and he, or on their walls. And he's thinking, oh my gosh, something that took me one minute or two minutes to write has had this dramatic impact on somebody's life and overall, overall morale. And so he writes, I don't know how, over a thousand handwritten letters, I guess that's about three per day. So, th so that makes sense. It's definitely doable to his employees. Uh, you want to definitely on their birthdays, on um, maybe important anniversary or when you first began uh, your start date in the company. And that's really meaningful to people. And he said, you know what? The, um, the best thing to do is, is just by being kind. I think some of us have forgotten what it means to be kind or how to be kind to others. You know, that is so profound, so simple. I love the simple, profound things because just writing a note, I mean, literally, like you said, it'll take a minute uh, to write it. And yet it is a keepsake. It's something that that person 
that'll mean so much to them just to see that written affirmation of their existence and of their achievements. And, you know, even just in our household, I mean, if, if my husband writes me something, um, wow. you know, even like something, if he writes a, a, a little sticky note, puts it on the fridge and it's like, I can't just throw that away. You know, it's no. something that, <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe after I've had it and it's gotten all, you know, mangled up after a year, I might throw it away. But, you know, it's, it's um, very sentimental, I think the hand, the written word and it is something that you can see over and over again even more than like somebody complimenting you that goes in one ear and you might hear it throughout the day but if you actually see this handwritten note from somebody that says you know you're amazing you're special you're doing a great job or whatever it is that they're saying and maybe you have some tips about what those handwritten notes could be composed of. I don't know if you mentioned that in your book at all, but you know, I just think that that honestly, I think the writing of it and the receiving of it and the reading of it and, and seeing it over and over again, is so simple and so profound. My, um, my daughter writes notes all the time. I don't know if it comes from me telling her to from the book or what, but she just naturally loves to not just notes because she's only five, so she can't write a whole lot, but she can spell <laughs> like, I love you, for example, which Aww. you don't want to write in the workplace. <laughs> no, probably but, not. <laughs> but I keep it in a little box. And um, I do mention Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, which is a very famous business book. And I discuss how Carnegie said that a person's name is like the sweetest thing the sweetest word to to that individual in the world. So first and foremost, you want to make sure you write their name. Um, also sign yours and date it. I think a date makes it even more specific. And if you're in the workplace, point out a specific um, project they did or something specific uh, about their work, not just I love what you do or you do great work. Um, point out page 22 of their project of, of the new HR, the new HR manual or new HR policy. Page 22 was very detailed and you agree with it 100%. Whatever it is, be specific, detailed. It doesn't have to be long. Uh, use their name and date it. Um, I, I think that's very meaningful. I agree with you. And um, yeah, absolutely the name, absolutely being specific. Because when somebody thinks, when somebody says, you know, oh, um, you look nice today, or I mean, the, and that's not a good example for this, but you know, when, when people are very vague about it, it almost like it takes away from what they are trying to get across, the sentiment that they're trying to get across. So it's like when, you know, when, when people have, a compliment for me it's like oh you're you know you're doing an excellent job and it's like well I want to know exactly what you mean by that yeah. you know like tell me exactly what you mean by I'm doing a good job was it the, the the book was it the way that it made you feel was it the recording was it the script was it you know what was it you know because I you know I, I want those accolades and I think I think those accolades um you know, when they're, when they're directed at something very specific, it just, it just means so much more. I, I frequently um, appear on TV talking about the economy and the stock market. And I received a letter from, I, I won't say who, but from a main anchor on a national, you know, television show that mm -hmm. every 10 appearances, he personally writes a letter and signs it. And he, he's specific about the topic on a certain day that we were talking about. So he doesn't just say, thanks for coming on my show, you know, great job. But he says, thanks for talking about the stock market and the recent rise in XYZ stock. He's very specific and, and that speaks to your point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, specifics really. Uh, and it's the same thing for like the other way around, you know, when somebody apologizes to you for something, you know, they say like, I'm sorry I'm about sorry. that. You know, it's like, well, what exactly are you sorry about? <laughs> you know, because then I want to know, you know. <laughs> so I, I make my husband spell it out like, okay, that's not good enough. You're sorry for what? Yeah, exactly. We're, the, we're on the same page about that. Because <laughs> like, I want to know, because if you just I'm sorry, then that means you don't even really know what you did. 
So I want to know. Just, they're just saying it to, to make to make you happy or to make us happy. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, <laughs> come back to me when you know exactly what. <laughs> um, so okay, so getting back to so that um, let's let's talk just a little bit about, you know, today's um, challenges from, you know, working from home, like what are some and I, I'm really curious only because I'm, a, I think I'm a little bit of a different bird here um, because maybe I'm, I come across as an extrovert, but I am actually very introverted. So working really? from home, yes. Um, working from home for me is a pleasure. I love it. I've been working from home since like 2005, uh, <laughs> even before that. <laughs> <laughs> so oh I, yeah, I haven't. I, so it's like, I've been set up with this situation, like since well before the pandemic it was like when the pandemic is like, welcome to my world. You know, this is exactly so you can wear yoga pants every day and nobody will care or ever see uh, how people have have transformed over this last year this is exactly my life. Like this is how I have lived. So I, so I understand though, you know, that, I mean, so like if it, it's a reverse for me, like if I had to go into the workforce, that would be, that would be a challenge. So I want to yeah. hear from your perspective. <laughs> well, yeah, I've been there. Talk if you have to go back to work, I think it helps more people who work in an office setting than from home, but it's still valid as well from home, yeah. I guess. <laughs> so for um, for those who are not, you know, uh, used to that, and you know, what kind of challenges are people experiencing right now with the work from home trend? So you're one of the few because IBM had a study um, that said, well, you're not one of the few. You're actually one. You're about ha roughly half are in line with with what you like to do, which is work from home. IBM study revealed that. Um, over, well, about half of Americans want to continue working from home that weren't before post-pandemic. Okay. So half of America and employees feel the way you do. And the other half, maybe like me, want to get out of the house. They have cabin fever and they want to go back to work. So the thing is, I think companies are going to be more flexible would be a good word with that. You look at um, technology companies like Twitter and Facebook, and th they're allowing people to work from home, some indefinitely, um, and make it kind of your choice, which I think I think is a good thing. If you're more productive from home, if your brain and your mind work better from home, then certainly do that if it reduces your stress levels. Um, but some of the challenges that we faced, which I have a chapter in the book that deals with the modern advances of technology, um, which is basically saying, we're not disconnecting from our from our devices, which is also a problem because if we're always like staring at a screen or at your phone doing work or maybe an iPad, you're never disengaging. You're, it's harder to be, which is, again, this would be what you would know about in the present moment, I think would mm -hmm. be the right way to say it. If you're always engaged with a screen, especially in social media. Um, the other study uh, that was mentioned, this was not IBM, but it said that on average employees, this isn't just people that don't have a job, check their phone once every 12 minutes and 40% <laughs> of people check every five minutes. That's crazy. Every five yeah. minutes, half of Americans check their phone. There is a problem that I'm guessing if you're at work in the office, you're probably not going to check your phone as much or the football score or what you know what's trending on twitter um because somebody's probably looking unless you're your own boss and so you wouldn't do that and i don't know if that's really helping us emotionally and mentally to always be on because now it's like it's a 24 7 workplace yeah when you're in the and office, it's an addiction it's yeah a, it's, it's a, nine to five but with yeah. working from home it's 24 7. Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's I agree. I mean, just for, for me, you know, working from home, having my own business. I mean, it's, it's like I'm on 24 hours a day and it, it can be very difficult. I have to be very disciplined in order to disconnect from it. And I even set up this, this thing in the morning where, you know, I do not check my uh, anything 
uh, until I do my meditation, my hypnosis, uh, read my book, journal and go for a walk. I have to get do all of those things. And it's about, you know, um, and I am, am, you know, from like five to nine, 5 a.m. To, to nine from 9 a.m. is really technically the first time I should ever see my email. But I have a hard time with it sometimes, you know, it's like before I open up my book, which is on my Kindle reader, which is on my iPad, it's like, oh, let me just, yeah, I even took my email and my Facebook off my front page and out of the little bottom bar, you know, just so I would not see the little numbers um, because you just wanted like... (laughs) (laughs) I turned off all the alerts from Facebook and Twitter. If I want to check, I'll go on, but I don't need to be alerted like that someone is tweeting. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, so having that, uh, that constant device connection, um, it really, you know, makes you like kind of um, not not very present to the moment and you're just not enjoying the moment because you're just constantly thinking about what's going on, what's going on out there, you know, and and feeling like I need to be connected to the, (laughs) to the world through, you know, I need to know all of the little things. And, you know, especially for me, because I run an online business. So it's just like, there's so many little things, how many books, how many app sales, how many, this sales, how many, this, you know, and it's, I, I could go around, and round by the time I'm done checking everything I'm back to the beginning like I can <laughs> oh I gotta you know it's it's, it, it, it's definitely it seems like someone challenge. like you though you have a good schedule that you can recommend to other people who are in the same boat or the same situation as you where everything online matters and that's what your life your work life dominates around being connected but you have it set where, like you said, you don't touch it till after meditation or after 9 a.m. You don't touch your phones or you try not to. Um, right. <laughs> so that you can have time for yourself. Yeah. And then the, and then the other thing I will also do is, uh, is do my Pomodoros. And so during the Pomodoros, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the um, where I will literally set a, uh, it's a Pomodoro timer. It's 25 minutes of complete focus time um, and then five minutes off. So during that 25 minutes of complete focus time, whether I'm making a recording, writing a script, um, working on my next uh, book or whatever project is dedicated to that time, uh, really it's like for, for two hours, there's four sets of those Pomodoros I'll do. And during that time, no social media, no email checking, none of that, you know, cause otherwise if I'm just, you know, free to do it without, you know, haphazardly just, I'll, I'll do it all day long. I mean, it's yeah. like just constant, you know, pushing the button for the little dopamine hit. <laughs> no, you're not alone. I'm sure many Americans, it, it, and the thing is that it's almost unconscious. It's become a habit to where, and I'm guilty of it, like I don't even realize, oh my gosh, I've just checked social media like 10 times in the past hour. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's it's not good. So while half of Americans want to keep working from home, I think there is some aspects of actually getting outside of the house in your own little bubble or your own little my own little world at home and going back to an office, um, I I think my relationships will improve. And Mm -hmm. I'm actually not sure that my productivity will improve because I've been able to be very productive working from home. You you reduce your commute time. Um, A lot of people say it's less stress, you know, reduce your stress levels by working from home and not having to get on a train or bus or ferry and deal with traffic. So there are pros and cons for sure. Absolutely. So what do you recommend a person do, you know, to kind of get themselves prepared and ready to like re-enter? You know, I I know that, you know, there's just got to be people that maybe they have gotten used to the working at home and they kind of want to, but they are like you, they, they, they know that they, they want to go back, you know, and, and enter the workforce again. So what are some things that people can do to get back into that place? 
So I think you have to ease yourself into it. And a lot of people, when they do go back, companies have started reporting their, their timing, whether it's April and May, when people hopefully have gotten at least one dose of the vaccine, if not both of, of you know vaccinations, and we can go back. Other companies are saying it may be September, but they're also putting an asterisk by that saying it's one day a week or it's two days a week in the office, which I thought recently I was like, wow. So they're not saying we're all just gonna go back to work. They're saying we're going to go back to work to the office, but one day at a time or two days at a time, which I think is a really good strategy to ease people into it. Um, I do actually think I'm not just, I mean, of course I'm biased, but I think the book will help people remember um, certain triggers of things you, you can and can't say or complimenting people and handwritten notes and um, body language, for example, thinking before you speak, maybe things that you don't have to say at home because nobody's around except your dog, whereas yeah. nobody <laughs> behind you that can hear you. They overhear what you're saying. So um, you do have to think a little bit differently as you enter the office, re-enter the yeah. office. Well, and I, I believe your book, uh, you know, the uh, man's guide to corporate culture, uh, which was just released and it is a bestseller. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, I think that's going to help a lot of people to, you know, with this re-entry into the workforce and not only just the re-entry, but just the, even if you've been there and you don't really understand how to navigate in today's uh, social environment, you know, this is going to help not just men, but also women, women to understand. I mean, it's, it's for everyone. And so yeah. congratulations on this book. And uh, once you. again, so people can go to amazon.com, or they can go to your uh, book page, and they can actually download a free chapter over on your book page? Yes, HarperCollins set up man's guide to corporate culture.com. I have to tell you, if you don't like to read, um, my husband, he and some of his friends who are men, they don't like to actually read, they like to listen. So audiobooks, mm -hmm. the woman who narrated the book, uh, Jill Blackwood, fantastic voice, engaging and pleasant, uh, really enjoyable experience for the audiobook. But the Man's Guide to Corporate Culture is available in your local bookstores as well. If you're not comfortable wearing a mask and supporting small business, then yes, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, it, it's there. Very easy to find. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your information and good luck with the, uh, with the book. And people, go ahead and get yourself a copy of the Man's Guide to Corporate, uh, corporate Culture. And thank you so much. Thank you, Victoria.